Working hard to be a doctor? Is your med school frustrating? Is the syllabus saturating your brain? Isn't it boring to sit in front of the big bada bada books for hours together with drooping eyelids? Or the internals freaking you out? Just pull yourself together. Now it's time to relax, sit back comfortably on your couch, grab a snack if you're hungry and just give an ear to what I'm gonna say now. So now is the time to have fun with your medical syllabus, it's time to cherish the beauty of medicine and it's time to study medicine with entertainment and we're proudly presenting Meditainment Experience the Joy of Learning Medicine. will be about a brief note on the topic edema and effusion. Before diving into the topic proper, let's taste some basic physiology. Usually inside the blood vessels exist two kinds of pressure. The one called the hydrostatic pressure which tends to force fluid outward and other called the oncotic pressure caused by the plasma proteins like albumin which tend to pull fluid into the vessel. Under normal circumstances, the tendency of vascular hydrostatic pressure to push water and salts out of capillaries into the interstitial space is nearly balanced by the tendency of plasma colloid osmotic pressure to pull water and salts back into vessels. There is usually a small net movement of fluid into the interstitium, but this drains into lymphatic vessels and ultimately returns to the bloodstream via the thoracic duct keeping the tissues dry. So usually under normal circumstances there is a balance between the hydrostatic pressure and the colloidal osmotic pressure. The same way there is a balance between the rate of fluid into the EVS is, uh, and the rate of lymphatic drainage. Any changes which, which disrupt this balance may lead to edema or effusion. So as I said there are two balances to be noted here. First balance between the hydrostatic pressure and the colloidal osmotic pressure and the second balance between the net rate of fluid into the extravascular space and the rate of lymphatic drainage. Any imbalance in these two may lead to edema or effusion. Firstly, what if there is an imbalance between the hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure? There are three cases. Firstly, only the hydrostatic pressure increases. Secondly, only the colloidal osmotic pressure decreases. And third case is that both hydrostatic pressure increases and colloidal osmotic pressure decreases. Both happens together. Secondly, what if there is an imbalance between the net rate of fluid into the extravascular space and the rate of lymphatic drainage? There is only one case which is the lymphatic obstruction. As I said, both these imbalances leads to fluid accumulation. If it happens in the tissues, it is called edema and if it happens in the body cavity, it is called effusion. So this fluid accumulated may be inflammatory or non-inflammatory. If it is an inflammatory fluid then it is called exudate and if it is a non-inflammatory fluid it is called transudate. How do you differentiate exudate and transudate? Exudate has more protein content whereas transudate has less protein content. This is a very important concept because this is being used in cases of ascites. In cases of ascites what happens is that the fluid is being tapped and checked for protein content to confirm whether it is a transudate or exudate and this may confirm if the fluid is inflammated or not. So now let's see in detail about the first imbalance that is between the hydrostatic pressure and colloidal osmotic pressure. The first case as I said when the hydrostatic pressure increases. This happens when there is an impaired venous return. That is any obstruction, a thrombus, a blood clot in a deep vein may lead to a deep vein thrombosis. When this happens in a lower ex extremity, it may lead to localized edema and in case of congestive heart failure, you will have a systemic edema. So as you see in this uh, type, in, in this image, what happens is that the left ventricle sends the blood into the arteries and the arteries send it to the arterioles and then it gets to, into the capillaries. Next, it get, goes into the venules and veins. Now we have an obstruction, a thrombus formation between the communication between the capillaries and venules and venules and veins and this leads to an obstruction in the uh, venous return. That is the veins 
send the blood that the oxygen blood right into the right atrium so that is being blocked so what happens is that the blood gets pulled up in these uh, venules and veins so this may lead to the edema second the second case is the decreased oncotic pressure as i said the oncotic pressure is being produced by the plasma proteins in our blood vessels so these plasma protein when they get decreased when the synthesis is decreased you may have decreased oncotic pressure so there are two cases that is increased loss of albumin in cases of nephrotic syndrome you have increased loss of albumin in your urine and the second case is the decreased synthesis of albumin that is in end stage cirrhosis cases you have decreased synthesis of albumin by your own liver and second is protein malnutrition when you don't supply enough albumin as we know this plasma proteins hold up the water in uh, in the blood vessels they pull the water into the blood vessels so once they get decreased what happens is that the fluid escapes out of the blood vessel leading to an edema so this may decrease the intravascular volume also and this may lead to renal hyperperfusion leading to a secondary hyperaldosteronism this results in salt and water retention by the kidney leading to an increased plasma volume again Now the plasma volume is decreased, but the protein content is still less. So this again leads to edema. So this exacerbates the edema. The third case is that both increase in hydrostatic pressure and decrease in oxygen pressure. This happens when the sodium and water are retained more. The increased hydrostatic pressure is due to the de- increased water retention, and the decreased oxygen pressure is again due to the increased water retention. This leads to dilution of the plasma proteins, leading to decreased oxygen pressure. So let's see when this case is possible. For example, in a congestive heart failure, as I said, you will have a decreased renal perfusion and the RAS will be activated, leading to increased sodium and water retention. So this may lead to an edema. So now let's see the se- see the second imbalance. The second imbalance is between the rate of fluid into into the EVS and the rate of lymphatic drainage. The only case in this. imbalance is the lymphatic obstruction the lymphatic vessels get obstructed this may be due to trauma fibrosis or an invasive tumor or infectious agents for example in filariasis cases where your lower extremity gets swollen it happens because of the lymphatic obstruction so this is when in your lower extremity in an external genitalia this is because the parasite induces obstructive fibrosis of lymphatic channels and lymph nodes leading to edema in lower extremity in external genitalia the same way breast removal along with its associated lymph nodes may lead to an severe edema of your upper extremities so now let's see the most commonly seen edemas the first one is your subcutaneous edema which is sometimes called dependent edemas these edemas are influenced by gravity for example when you stand for a long time the gravity pulls the fluid down and this leads to an edema in your legs similarly a prolonged hospitalized stay may lead to an edema of your sacrum second most common is your lung edema or pulmonary edema this may be due to left ventricular failure renal failure acute respiratory distress syndrome pulmonary inflammation the third one is your brain edema What happens is the brain gets swollen and this leads to narrowing of salsa and gyri in your brain. The complications mainly are it may compress the vascular supply to the brain stem or sometimes the serious complication is that the brain substance may herniate through the foramen magnum. So now the most commonly seen effusions as I said when fluid gets accumulated in your body cavities it is called effusion. If it is seen in the pleural cavity, it's called a hydrothorax. In pericardial cavity, it is called a hydropericardium. In the peritoneal cavity, it's called a situs. Now, summing up, as you see in this picture, when a fluid gets accumulated in your tissues, it's called edema, and if, and if it gets accumulated in your body cavities, it's called effusion. And three causes to remember is your when your hydrostatic pressure increases, when your oncotic pressure decreases, and when is when there is a lymphatic block. These three causes may lead to an edema or an effusion. Now, based on the fluid accumulated, it may be classified into an exudate or a transudate. Exudate means some inflammation is going on, and transudate means it's a non-inflammatory state. Thank you for more videos.